Hi, and welcome to another installment of the Monkey Mind Relaxation Chatter about the Chatter podcast. And we've got a pretty cool uh, guest speaker today who's going to be talking about his life. And oh, look at the smile. Look at that. You pretty are. Cool. <laughs> it's like the lights are on. I, I always remember a, a good friend of mine saying, uh, even if you open the door of the fridge, if you've got a spotlight, you'll dance. And that just cracked me up. Every time I open the fridge door, I think about you, Phil Walker. Yeah. Any yeah, time there's a spotlight. Every time you put the, open the fridge door, you do 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm Cuddy Cud with the host of this. Uh, everyone uh, knows me uh, for being just the largest, friendliest guy you'll ever meet. Uh, life coach, uh, helping people get past anxiety and depression however we can. And we're talking about that chatter about the chatter, that monkey mind relaxation. If it's not in check, it can take over our lives. Now, the reason we got you in for the podcast, Phil, uh, who is a comedian, he is an actor, he is a kid's author uh, of The Slots, which is a fabulous kid's book. But you are <laughs> going to be a thespian as well. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Start during the uh, the lockdown. I've always, so, I mean, I've done pantomimes. That's the nearest kind of thing I've yeah. done, done to acting. But I've always fancied having a go at it. So during the lockdown, I started learning a few monologues and songs and stuff just to keep my mind active. Uh, that was good for my mental health, you know. Yeah, exactly. Learning that um, it gave me something to focus on because obviously I couldn't do the stand up. Um, so did that and just got really got the bug for it and um and then luckily i did a couple of um beginning of this year i did a couple of student movies like these short movies that they make you know towards their exam pieces and uh, really had a great time on them and off the back of that i managed to get myself uh, sending the clips that i had sent that out to uh, a couple of agents and I've been signed up by an agent now. So she's putting me up for, um, for commercials and stuff like that. All and right. Okay. Well, you said you an agent, these, I was thinking you you were selling stuff. houses. I didn't realize an estate agent, not an estate agent. Then. No, no, it's, it's a theatrical agent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. An estate agent's completely different. They, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they rip you off in other ways. <laughs> It's so, go on. No, <laughs> it's the reason we got you on is is not only do we know each other from from our previous endeavors working on on cruise ships and, and traveling the world together. In fact, we had a fabulous day out in Portugal. Remember? We did on the e scooters. On the scooters. Yeah, I remember it well. <laughs> First time I've been on one. Yes, me too. Great fun. Great fun. Love that going all around. And they had a good setup there, didn't they, with the track and everything. Down yes. by the court, you know, which I mean, I've said I've been through, I, they've got them now in Liverpool, but people are just going along the road, you know, like without it. helmets on and stuff. And it's just, it's not good at all. Liverpool, <laughs> sort your e scooter <laughs> tracks out. <laughs> I think we, on, when we were in Portugal, I think we would ride it on the tram lines, to be honest with you. I'm not sure. We it was were actually, yeah, yeah. yeah. It wasn't a specific scooter uh, line for us. But it was nice down there, down by the front, wasn't it? It was, it was. There was plenty of, you know, we weren't in people's way, we weren't in traffic way. No, no, yeah. absolutely not. Then you got your nice new shoes as well. I did. I've still got those purple and gold shoes, those clown <laughs> shoes that I uh, bought myself. Yeah. Yeah. You like your shoes, don't you? I do like my shoes and footwear, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, I'm a bit of a sneakerhead as well. How many how many pairs of shoes or trainers do you reckon well, you've got? Before lockdown, I had about 17 pairs of uh, um, trainers, uh, but I know that some of my trainers were worth a lot of money, so I sold them on eBay. Wow. <laughs> Good for you. So I've only got about 12 pairs of uh, sneakers now. Um, yeah. And you've if got things carry on, I'll probably only have five pairs of sneakers. And what size, what size shoes are you? You've got huge feet, haven't you? I, I've got very big feet, which we know that means I've got very big socks. Uh, <laughs> <and nothing else. laughs> and in case you misheard me, I did say socks. Uh, it's not yeah. a plural. Um, uh, so yeah, size 13. I've got a size 13 wide foot. Wow. I'd be no good on them. No. <laughs> They'd be like clown shoes on me. <laughs> Pretty much. Pretty much. <laughs> So we, we, you had the year where you were a stand-up comedian, you were gigging all over the world, yeah. and boom, COVID happened, everything stopped. Phil, what was, what was that chatter like for you? What was it going on? What was going on? Uh, well, initially, 
it was just horrendous and just seeing your diary just disappear in front of you, you know, because as you knew, you know, when we were doing the cruises and even the stuff in the UK, pantomimes and stuff like that were booked, you know, for the whole year, the whole, and you're, you're thinking, oh, I'm secure for this year, because it's a very, if, you look, if people from the outside, in the normal world, if you will, would, would, would look at our sort of uh, way of making a living, you know, that the security isn't like, oh, what are you going to be doing in five years' time? Well, I'm going to be in this job and I'm going to be earning this much and blah, blah, blah. Ours kind of go from month to month sometimes. You know, sometimes you're lucky enough to be booked, you know, six to eight months or maybe 12 months in advance, but nothing more than that. You know, it sort of changes yearly. So, um, so yeah, so to see all that disappear well, was pretty horrific, you know. Um, and then... Well, I mean, the only comfort I could kind of take from it was we were all, you know, as speaking to other entertainers as, that I knew and stuff, we were all kind of in the same boat, you know, as were. But not were, literally. Not, no, we weren't in the same, <laughs> on the same cruise. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that that was the only way. I mean, at first it was, I enjoyed the uh, the lockdown kind of, thing you know um obviously missed the money side of it but um um spending time with the family and uh you know and the sort of novelty side of it was kind of because we didn't know how long it was going to last and stuff at first but i thought um, it was a good that's a really good point is what when it did kick off last year it was march we're all be like uh ah, by june we'll be all right june everything will start yeah. again <laughs> Have a bit of a party for a few months. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's all right. I can do with the next couple of weeks off a vacation or a bit of a holiday. It's fine because I've been yeah. busy. And yeah. then when September comes, oh. Uh... Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I used to fantasise about what it would be like to um, uh, to retire, you know. <laughs> Turns out, 18 months on, it was pretty crap. <laughs> <laughs> you know, after you completed Netflix and done everything you wanted to do, it was like, okay, I need to do some work now. Yeah, you know? yeah, absolutely. Uh, now you've got quite a few, uh, quite a few, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? There's a, there's there's many streams of, of income for you because you are a kid's author as well. Yeah, yeah, that was another thing. Yeah, th through the pantomimes really, and because I've done 18 pantomimes in my career, um, and um, entertaining kids was, I've always loved it, you know, I've always liked the, the sound of uh, ch children's laughter and working out ways of, you know, entertaining them and the families. And when my daughter, I've got a daughter, she's slightly older now, she's 18 now. She, um, and uh, but when she was younger, I used to like reading her stories and I've always liked kids stories. So I used to just jot down a few silly ideas, you know, for uh, for, for stories, um, which I still do to this day. And uh, and it was just one of those chance meetings. Uh, a guy who was an illustrator, uh, Tim Stead, who illustrated the book for me. Well, the books, I've got two now. <laughs> uh, um, he, uh, he approached me and just said, well, look, have you got an idea for a story? I, you know, I want to collaborate with someone who's in involved in comedy because I want a sort of comedic twist to a story so we did that and um the, you know we really got a publishing deal and it, it was all it all set off pretty good and and the good thing for me was I was we were going around the schools because of my Lancashire connection because I did four years at Preston Guildhall writing and directing the pantomimes there um all the schools in the area knew who I was so once the publicity of the book came out, they all wanted me to go to the school and, and read the story to them. And they got a chance to uh, buy the book and all that kind of stuff. So that, it, so that was another, that was another tour that was like, you know, I did like 20 or 30 schools in that, that particular year. And then we were planning on bringing the second book out and doing it in 2019. And then of course, uh, everything happened that happened so all that went um so we're just kind of waiting now to to see what will happen in the future to maybe get back in there whether it be via zoom like this and going into the classrooms because that's the good thing now they have they all have these smart screens yeah they're not blackboards anymore could he i don't know if you know that um, <laughs> 
that's what shocked me when I first went. I was like, where's the chalkboard? Where do I, <laughs> you know? Yeah, uh, I, I do stay away from schools. Uh, so I, I, I <laughs> for various reasons. <laughs> Let's not discuss that you now. Go into that, no, but obviously, I don't go around schools as much as you do, which sounds mm. wrong on many levels, Phil. But no, no, no. Actually, it was stories, very. The stops. It was, I remember the first time I went in, it was so nerve wracking. It was like starting again as, a, as an entertainer because suddenly you're in the, uh, the staff canteen and you've got your pile of books and you're just about to go out in front of the whole school in the, the assembly hall and you've got kids from like little ones right up to sort of uh, year sixes, which is like 10 or 11 year old. And uh, it was quite nerve, you know, I was like nerve wracking at first. You know, you have to kind of work out what am I going to say here to entertain these people and stuff. But then it just sort of kicks in and you get out there. And I used to, I used to love it. I used to really love doing them schools, you know, meeting the kids and, you know, and then, you know, you'd work out a different routine, taking the mickey out of the certain teachers and stuff. And the kids loved all that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so that was, yeah, that was like a second thing for me yeah. as well as the comedy. So I, I, I've always tried to sort of vary my work up anyway, because I think if you do the same stuff all the time, it, you can get into a sort of a rut, you know, like even with my comedy, you know, I'll do like, like I said, pantomimes, um, I do the stand-up comedy clubs, you know, all the big comedy clubs I've done all then. Um, I also do corporate events and the cruises, obviously, with the likes of Cuddy Cudworth, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, travelling the high seas. So it, it keeps it varied and it keeps it um, fresh, you know, so you're not just doing the same thing all the time. Yeah, yeah. And keeps I you busy, keeps you busy more than anything, you know. We do like to keep busy. We do. We were always yeah. yeah no, you got to you know, you got to pay the bills. Yep, absolutely, one hundred percent. So the actual kids' story is the snots. So where did the idea of the snots come from? <laughs> uh, well, I've you know I just put a list of stuff down of things that I, that kids find funny. You know, like they 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 like laughing at underpants and stuff like that, and farting and trumps and uh, sweaty socks and most kids pick the nose. So I, and then, so I had a list of all these sort of stuff down and I just started writing silly little stories around them. And, and one of the stories that turned out to be the snots was, uh, I, you know, I just, just had this thought of this kid who's picking his nose and inside his nose, there's these little, these little creatures, these little snots uh, are, are having a little life of their own. And in the first story, I wanted to make it a bit educational as well. So like in the first story, um, he, without spoiling the story for anyone who hasn't read it yet, <laughs> basically what happens is the little boy picks his nose and ends up um, picking the snots out of his nose, the little family, there's like Sid, Snot, Mummy and Daddy. And then he ends up eating them and then he swallows them. Oh. They end up, yeah, they end up jumping onto this sweet that's also in his mouth. And it's like a water, you know, those like uh, water park rides. Yeah. They end up going down his throat. And then it's like a journey to the center of the earth through his body. So mm. it's like an educational thing. So like the, the little boy's going, oh, what's that, dad? And he's, oh, that's a heart. Sid. What's a heart? And oh, that, that's it. And he tells him what a heart is. What are those? Those are lungs. And so it's like, it's, there's a little bit of education in there as well. And, and the, 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 uh, the illustrations that, uh, that Tim put to the book, just really brought it to life as well. Because yeah. I wanted the first one to be aimed at sort of very young readers, kid, you know, kids that are just getting into books. Because that's the one, that's the other thing I learned going around the schools was they, they were really pushing for authors to come into schools. Um, they were really keen to have us going in there because they wanted to get kids back into reading because kids weren't reading books. Yeah, uh, they're on the computer games and stuff, which is fun, you know. But they, you know, they, they, you can't be, you know, reading a good book and and they, you know, and uh, the schools wanted to get the kids back into it. So having people like me going in there and having a bit of fun with them and saying, look, books can be fun, and that was another thing. Parents, you know, they, you know, parents weren't reading to the kids because you know we all live busy lives and you know some some families 
both parents are working and they get back and you're tired and you, you know you have your tea and just have a bit of a chat and you, you can't really you know you haven't got the energy to do the stuff anymore so True. and we all live fast lives so so like my point is that you know they were trying to get people back in to reading stories and you can't beat that little, you know I, I remember as a parent just having that little 10 minute thing before she drops off to sleep you know if you read a couple of pages it's just really nice it's a nice thing to do nice it is. Yeah. It's a great way to connect with the kids. I think reading a story to someone, even if you like adults, you know, if you're in bed with your partner and just if you read it, read them a story. So, you know, just close your eyes and listen to them read you a story. It's quite relaxing. I don't know whether you've ever done that with your better half. <laughs> I... <laughs> Obviously not the snots, you know. <laughs> you know, maybe pick something, you know, a bit more adult. Yeah. All right. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't well, have to be. This podcast is going down adult, a completely different it road. Be, it could be like Lord of the Rings or something like that. Or, you know, to have someone read to you is quite therapeutic. Nice. It is, yeah. Nice. Try it. Mix Thank it you very bit. much, Phil. Thank you. You know, we've started mixing things up in the bedroom recently, you know. Um, and you're reading stuff now. It's, I mean, it's fantastic. Yeah, we, yeah, we have. And the other night, we, we actually swapped sides. That's how dangerous my life is at the moment. You know, I slept on the left-hand side, which is normally her side. I couldn't do that. Right. Ch even though change... <laughs> no, <laughs> there's some things that shouldn't change. The side of the bed is not one of them. Once, is that a thing? It's once you pick your side, that's it, isn't it? That's in it. a relationship. That's it. Like picking your team, isn't it, as a young... <laughs> <laughs> You're either a Man United fan or a Liverpool or whatever. So <laughs> once you pick your side, that's it. You're done. Absolutely not. <laughs> if I picked the, uh, I've picked for, for, for my side of the bed, I've picked the left side of the house and she's on the right side of the house. Right. So, uh... <laughs> <laughs> so you've got a wall, a wall in between you. Great. Oh, it's the best way. Oh, the amount of sleep you get is, is amazing. It's so much better, especially for your mental <laughs> health. <laughs> so uh, you, uh, so last year when, when everything went um, um, belly up, if you like, I remember seeing you doing a charity bike ride. Now I got into, I was cycling a lot last year. I know my training's changed this year, but cycle, last, last year I was into heavily into cycling. What else could we do? That's in fact, that was the, that was the thing that kickstarted everything for me with, the, with COVID last year was you had this list of things we weren't allowed to do. Now, if you were to listen to the things that you weren't allowed to do, you would have been stuck. And that's why the mental health issues have gone the way that they've gone uh, because you're listening to what you can't do. And then we forget, well, actually, no, but you can do this because there was you, you could still walk from your house for five miles and all the way around. You could still walk as long as you're on your own. There was no issues with that. So <laughs> I started walking and cycling on my own. That was the thing. You could still go out for bike rides. And I remember seeing you doing a charity bike ride last year. So what was that uh, in aid of? Yeah, well, that was, uh, I mean, I, I, I got into cycling a few years before that. You know, I had done... Um, sort of long distance rides, but nothing as far as that in a day. And I always wanted to do coast to coast, uh, which is Blackpool to Scarborough in a day. I and mean, some people do it over two or three days, or some people have done the, Notfield it's walk. called the, yeah, the Wayne, not Phil Walk, you know, the Wayne Wright's Walk is a famous walk that you go across. The Pennine uh, Way, right? Pennine Way, yes. It and goes it's through my old neck of the woods. It's, yeah, it's stunning, absolutely stunning. So uh, I just thought, well, I'll, the perfect opportunity to do it, you know, because I've, um, no I've got no work, I've got nothing else to do, and I needed something to focus towards. Focus. So I just started training and getting myself pretty fit and cycling and running and swimming. And, um, and then I just, had a, I just went, right, OK, I'm going to do this. Just decided I was going to do this ride. Um, didn't know what charity to give, to give it to because I, I have done charities for like hospices and stuff like that. And and then uh, before lockdown, we did a couple of charity shows for the um, Comedians Society, which is um, um, for comedians who've fallen on hard times. Because a lot of comedians don't, we don't have like uh, pensions or health plans and stuff like that. So you know, we we live kind of hand to mouth kind of thing. You know, and sometimes. Yeah. There was a, a good friend of ours a couple of years ago. He's back working now and he's fine, but he had uh, he just had a stroke. You know, wasn't an old guy or anything, wasn't overweight. Just suddenly had a stroke, 
Uh, he's got a young family and couldn't work. So a lot of comedians got together and uh, did a charity show for him at the comedy store and raised some money, a couple of, you know, a couple of quid, well, it was a couple of grand actually to, to get him through and, and uh, you know, help him pay the bills. And then one of the organizers of that decided, well, this is a good charity to, you know, to, to, to set up and it's, it's become a thing now. Yeah. So I decided I'll try and raise a few quid for that, which, which is what we did on the bike ride, you know, so it went to a good cause. And I know what I did. So I remember seeing you did you doing that bike ride and that inspired me because I, I know we kind of, whether you realize it or not, we were on that really back. Yeah. Every time you did 60 miles, I'm like, right, I've got to go and do 64 miles, <laughs> right? Really? <laughs> when wow. you did 75, I'm like, right, I've got to go and do 78 well, miles. Well, I wish I'd known that. I'd have, <laughs> I'd have, I'd have tried a bit harder. <laughs> so, I, that's because I like I like competition. I do. I, I've always been a fan yeah. of competition. I, I do. And I, I kept watching it, all those relive apps. And I'm like, oh, I've got to do two more miles. And believe it or not, I've got a friend who's up the street, uh, Brian. And he was he was like, when I did 76 miles, he was like, I've got to go do 77 miles. So you were leaving <laughs> at the front. He was following me. So I did last year, I did 101 miles in a day. It, wow. was, it was, oh, it was horrible. How long did it take you? It took me 11 and a half hours. Is that, is that in the Highlands as well? Well, that was the thing, because I didn't do my research. I was just looking for a bike ride that was 100 miles in a day. I set myself a goal of 100 miles in a day. And I didn't realize I had to cycle past two Munros for that one. <laughs> <laughs> so the first Munro I got round, I was like, all right, okay. So I must, I'm, I'm like, my app kind of broke down because the battery went down on my little uh, dongle, whatever you want to call it. So I didn't know what Darling. miles I was at. So I'm like, well, I've been cycling for about five, five hours. That's about 50. I must, I must be at 60 miles by now. So once I got to the bottom of that Monroe, I, I, I found an app or I found something and went, oh, you've only done 44 miles. I'm like, holy shit. Wow. I got another, and I was dying by then. The cramps had kicked in at 44 miles. What kind of bike were you on? And I was on a mountain bike. Oh, my. Even and worse. they're heavier. They're heavier, right? We know yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. You can't go as fast. No, you can't go as fast. It's a heavier bike. But I, I, Phil, you know me. I'm six foot two and three feet wide. I always feel like I need a sturdier <laughs> bike, yeah. a sturdier steed to carry me going, to be honest with you, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not <laughs> saying anything. <laughs> so I, 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 so it was now my intern I know what my monkey mind was like at 44 miles I'd started cramping up and I'd, I'd basically I'd set myself the goal of doing 101 miles in a day and I'm like at 44 miles and a little tear came down because <laughs> I'm like oh all the shame the embarrassment of what am I going to say to my wife when I say I need picking up from Ben Lawyer's Monroe because I can't get any further <laughs> So I started taking the magnesium tablets. I was drinking it all down. I was getting all these things. I'm like, all right, the cramps are going, the cramps are going. And I knew I'd got a big downhill coming. So the next 20 miles, 25 miles, because I was looking at the, the plan was, oh, it's downhill, it's downhill, not a problem. So I think I got to about 86 miles and that was me coming up to the second top of this Munro. Really big hill. And I was, I was, I was broken. I was, I was absolutely yeah. broken. I went full on David Goggins. Do you know David Goggins? No. Right, so David Goggins is 100%. When you think your tank is empty, you've got another 80%. You're nowhere near your 80%. You, you're wow. nowhere near. You've got to get past that chatter, that conversation saying you're rubbish. You can't do it. Yeah. So I nearly, nearly called a cab to say, can you fit a mountain bike in the back of the car? Because I've got, I've got 16 miles left to get back to the car, and I'm literally in purgatory. Every muscle was clenched. So I washed, walked the bike cycled, walked the bike. Every time there was a downhill and I, I, when I got back, it was 101 miles and I was absolutely broken. It was horrible. And wow. I had the biggest fish and chips I ever had, but I know what my chatter was like. And I know that with all the stuff that I've been doing for years, which is what I do with all my clients and stuff like that, is I'm like, this is what you need to do. This is what you need to do. Keep calm, focus on your breath. When, when, when I wanted to cry, it's all right. Have a cry, but have a laugh at the yeah. same time. I've got this association. So what was that? How many miles was it for you that coast to coast? 146. Yeah, I knew it. I knew it was so much more. So what was your internal chatter like? Well, I mean, that, that, was, the, that was the other thing, because I didn't realise how hilly it was across there. You know, um, you, what, it, going over the Yorkshire Dales is yeah. quite brutal. You it's know? horrible. Um, and that, I mean, I, but fortunately for me, 
a year before I'd done uh, a friend of mine, Alan Anderson, who's a, a Scottish comedian, he invite, kindly invited me up. He does this three day event where it's uh, the Highlands bike ride challenge and you go right. across Glencoe and all that. Lot, and it's, nice. it's 100 miles a day. Yeah. And there's a lot of hills, but we're on road bikes, you know, which yeah. is much better than a mountain bike. It really and is. what I learned over those three days was all about the nutrition and stuff that you need to be taking into. So they had loads of like stops, like every 20 or 30 miles, there'd be like volunteers there with, you know, uh, pretzels and anything else, water, you know, top your water up and, uh, you know, Mars bars and all this kind of stuff. They, they'd done the research on what your body needs, you know, a bit of sugar, a bit of salt and all this kind of stuff. So I was kind of pre-armed with that knowledge when I went into the Scarborough ride. Now, you can't just set off with a bottle of water. It ain't going to work. That's why you were <laughs> cramping. That's why you were cramping up. I think the cramp came from I had a cup of tea at a hotel on the way around. I'm like, I'm just going to have a cup of tea and a digestive. Cup of tea and a scone. I'm, having... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to have a cup of tea. I fancy a Scottish Scottish cup of tea because yeah. I know I've got a big hill coming. I'm going to have a digestive just to refuel. Yeah. Um, and then halfway up, it's like, oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Off the mic, off the mic. That was hilarious. But yeah, no, so you did the refuel. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, well, so, well, but seeing those seeing those hills coming towards you is quite daunting. You just think, right, I've got to get over that. And it, for me, it was the last. Tw I remember it was the last twenty miles. I almost hit a wall because um, my, my wife Janet, she kindly followed in the support vehicle, so we met up with strategic parts. And then, uh, obviously, the next day we were coming back. We put the bike in the car and came back from Scarborough. We stayed over the night, but. Um, that I remember the last 20 miles and got to like 120 odd miles and uh, I just thought, you know, I can't go any further. You know, I was just mentally almost gone. But then I had a little talk to myself and I just went, right, you know, you've come this far. You can't, you can't back down now, you know. Um, so just got back on the bike and, and, you know, you just go, right, okay, just keep pedaling, keep pedaling, keep going, you know, and, um, and and just got nearer and nearer, and then you just think, right, okay, we've cracked this now, and you just yeah, and then the elation starts because you're like three or four miles away. Yeah, you think, right, I'm done, I'm done it now, I've done it. Yeah, you know? and then you see Scarborough in the distance, and that was it, boom, you know. And that's uh, so never... nice that your wife was there with you in the support vehicle. Yeah, yeah, it was great. Um, you know, because um, well, she wasn't doing anything either. <laughs> Like it's like, I'm going to let you tell a nice story about your wife, but I'll tell you a story about my wife while I'm doing 101 miles, just for the hell of it. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it, it was it was really nice because um, I wouldn't have been able to do it otherwise, you know, if I hadn't got some. And if that was the other thing as well. Who else is going to do it? Because, you know, you're not supposed to be in contact with other people mm -hmm. from outside. I couldn't go it, couldn't do it with a mate or someone like that because, you know, we were in bubbles then, weren't we, yeah. in the summer? So, um, so yeah, it was nice to have her there <clears throat> to sort of help me along with it, you know. And it was just a little box ticked, you know. I've done that now, so and then it's the and then it's the down afterwards because you're thinking, I want I want to do something else now. Well, you inspired me, and I'm going to do a coast to coast in Scotland from Crail to uh, Greenock. That's oh wow, miles. and it's 113 miles. Well, wow. when are you planning on doing it? Well, I was planning on doing it June this year, so. <laughs> Good time of year to do it in the summer. So, yeah, I will, I will be waiting because I know I've been doing, so I've been doing strongman training. So strongman training is not, is not ideal to cycling for long distances and stuff like that. Is that sort of west to east or? Uh, it'll be east coast to west coast of Scotland. All right. So you do the coast to coast. I'm like, I, wanna, I really want to do the coast to coast. Yeah, because um, you've got to look not... out for the winds as well. Because like, yes. I have the, the westerly winds at my back because oh, they well, change in the summer. They change so the, the winds, I did a bit of research beforehand because a friend of mine did it the other way and it took him much, much longer because he had the wind against into, his, into his face most of the way and that, it can make a difference. 
That is horrible. I did. Uh, yeah. I've done the canal. I've done uh, Edinburgh Canal to Glasgow, which was seventy-seven. Uh, I did eighty-six miles. It was there and back. But I got. I got the train back. So I had to get back home. I got a phone call from the wife. She's never that supportive when it comes to cycling. Because <laughs> when it was on, when I was on the canal, I got on in Edinburgh to go to Glasgow to come back on the canal, which was going to be about ninety-six miles or something there and back. And she texts me about six hours in. She went, "Don't forget, we've got my brother-in-law coming round tonight. You need to be here because we're having dinner." So I had to get the train back. <laughs> I right. said, well, I've got another two hours left before I get the train. Then, all right, I'll get the train. And then I got the mask because I was just cycling. It's like, all right, I've got to go and get a mask here from somewhere. So I got the train. <laughs> I got the train back. Yeah. So my wife wasn't that supportive on my bike ride round. Uh, oh. She just said, text me when, when you cycle around to make sure I know you're alive. I went, I'm in the Highlands of Scotland. There's no reception. Love. She went, <laughs> all right, no worries. Just text me when you get back to the car then. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> no, in all fairness, Carol does get she gets she hates me going out and doing all these these silly things that we do. But it's 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 in us, isn't it, Phil? Yeah, yeah. You it, and it, I think if you're into that sort of thing, you know, I think it's it's nice to have that sort of something to focus towards. You know, focus, um, a goal. You know, um, right. You know, let's see. It, I'm. I mean, I'm all about now is pushing myself out of my comfort zone because the easiest thing to be is just like we all you know you get to a level at anything whatever you're doing cycling running comedy anything really your job and you're just like oh yeah I can just coast along doing this now but I think every so often you have to put yourself in a situation where you oh I don't like this you know I'm not, not sure true. about this you know and I think it's a good thing to do you know, it's, it just, you, you're just testing yourself, aren't you? You know, yeah. and absolutely. I, you no, know, and that's, that's, that's what I want to do all the time now. Cause I, want, I just, I want that, I want that uncomfortable feeling. It's, it, it's where we grow. It is 100% where we grow. Yeah. Um, and I know whenever I've got in, into those comfort zones, with everything I've done in the past, it's where complacency pops up. And that's where yeah. we're not getting challenged and it does become too easy. And that's that's what those challenges come along. And I think if anything, for, for a lot of people, especially in the industry that, you, that you, you're working in, that will have made a lot of people and also broken a lot of people at the same time. Because if, yeah. if you don't have that mindset to be able to say, well, this is going to be something to challenge us. Let's get past this however we can. And we, I saw what you did. And that's why I wanted you on the, on the podcast and stuff like that. I can see there's going to be a lot of people that didn't have that, that mindset to be able to, to, to pivot, change direction. A lot. Yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, I mean, that's, that's one thing I have done pretty much when I look back, when I've looked back in hindsight, I, I've always tried to challenge myself. Like when I first started off, I was doing the, the holiday parks and stuff like that. And, uh, and then decided, you know, I didn't really want to go down that route for too long. It just wasn't for me, for where I wanted to be. So I started doing the, the comedy clubs, mm -hmm. you know, and it was basically starting all over again, doing five minute open spots at, you know, at little comedy clubs down in London and stuff and uh, learning that process. So it was putting you back out of your comfort zone, and, you know, and um, even during lockdown, learning new stuff like, a friend of mine introduced me to, uh, not personally, but introduced me to Wim Hof. You know, I got into Wim Hof. Right. Is, um, the Iceman, you know. He, oh, I, I am fully aware of the the Iceman, Wim oh, Hof. I love him. I am. So, you know, we, we started doing his breathing exercises, you know, yeah. and, um, and that's another thing, putting yourself out of your comfort zone. You know, the first time you, it was just like, okay, how, how long can I hold my breath for? You know, because it's, his big philosophy is as well as people aren't breathing properly. And if you, yeah. if you learn how to breathe properly, that can help you a lot with stress and in stressful situations and exercise, you know, you're going to get me into the whole knowledge of the vagus nerve and how our breathing, we are, we become mouth breathers. Yeah. And can't. mouth breathing is not the way to breathe. It's no. one of the most and, toxic and if, ways you can you're breathe. Yeah, if you're exercising, people, you know, you're exercising, you start getting out of breath. It's learning to control that and, and slow it down and making you exercise better, you know. I mean, the Wim Hof, the thing, the thing that shocked me when I first did the Wim Hof or, or attempted to do it was, you know, normally if we held our breath, you go like, if you go in underwater in a pool, we go... <gasps> 
and you've, bre you've just breathed in, so your whole body is tense then, and you can't do it, you can't do it for long because you're too tense, everything's tense. So it's, his is like, you know, it's breathing in and breathing out in, in a circle, and then the, your last breath is out, it's, and then you just stop, and suddenly you're relaxed, and then it's how long you can hold it for. <laughs> no. You know, legend has it that he can do 12 minutes. Legend has it. Yeah, well, he's done, he has done 12, 12 minutes underwater, swimming underwater. Wow. In the That's cold. Amazing. Yeah. So I, mean, I, 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 I tried to do the Wim Hof last year because I, I, we talked about it before we did the podcast. I know I, the competition we have to do then. Oh, I love <laughs> dipping. Everyone thinks I'm an idiot and I'm like, I don't mind. I don't care. The amount of people that have, have first of all said, What are you doing going to the sea? You're going to catch new money. I'm like, No, it's the opposite. Yeah. It's the actual opposite. This will make you healthier. Yeah. You, I mean, yeah, me and my friend uh, Justin, when we were training last year during the lockdown, and, you know, we, we used to go along St. Anne's Beach up and down the sand dunes, really intense up and down the sand dunes training, you know, and then into the sea afterwards. And in the February and March, it was proper cold, as you know, the Blackpool North, you know, oh, the Blackpool I... But you're only in there for a few minutes. Coming out, you just feel a million dollars. You really do. Yeah. It's, uh, you just feel alive. Yes. Totally alive. Um, and we, we would sit in it just talking to each other. You know, we'd just go up to our, you know, up to our, after we'd had a swim, we'd just sit there talking to each other. And, you know, because we were we were both watching Wim Hof and stuff, and and his big thing is is about going into these ice baths and and again it's it's pushing your body beyond where you think it, it can be because we're not we we don't we don't use half of our capabilities I don't think what we can, what we are capable of yeah and that's the thing you just once you start doing stuff like that, you think well how far can I go with this how, you know how you know, within, without killing yourself, obviously, <laughs> but, uh, you know, how far, and it's, and like you say, it's, it's, it's great for the mind. It's great for the body and the mind, you know, and going in the sea, going in cold water, it's fantastic. It, what it does for your body and it's when it kicks in the shivers and things like that. Yeah. That's stimulating your immune system around your body and it just kickstarts absolutely everything. So, I, I'll be honest with you, I've not dipped as much in the summer because I feel the the awesomeness of dipping, is, it dissipates a little bit because I'm like, well, I, I'm not really going to take pictures when I've got three six-year-old kids at the side of me uh, <laughs> in the water. It kind of takes away the super because everyone, everyone knows I'm always like, oh, I'm not yet Superman, not yet Superman. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to do it. I can't wait. I'm like, the winter started, I know the weather started changing and I went down for a 6 a.m. Uh, dip yesterday. I'm like, oh, this is it. This is this is what it's all about again. I Getting can't better, wait yeah. for the hor horrible weather. I can't wait for the winter. <laughs> I can't wait for the winter so I can go and dip and really prove to myself actually these are the things that you can do. Actually, I thought of you the other day. Uh, we were over. We went camping, um, staycationing over in uh, beautiful Runswick Bay on the east coast near Sca near Scarborough, and um, and in between Whitby and Scarborough, and we went for a a long walk along the beach one day and we almost got cut off by the tide. The tide was coming in, so we were racing to get past. Otherwise, we'd have been cut off because it's big cliff edges and stuff. So I'm walking along and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this this seal just appeared out of the water. <laughs> and all I could think, and it had, I don't know what it was. Like, all I could think of was you just floating around whenever I see you, floating around in the water. Was that, it looks like Cuddy. Yeah. <laughs> As long as it wasn't a whale, I'll take the seal compliment. No, it was a seal. It was a beautiful seal. <laughs> with little, it had a little silver tuft on the top of its head. <laughs> <laughs> it, was all, it was almost laughing at us, you know, as if to say, I'm a, look at me, come and, you know, come and join me in here. It's great fun. I do. Look, I practice gratitude an awful lot. I love, I love everything that, that, that's been going on recently and stuff like that. So, uh, moving to the future, have you got, are you booked for the uh, Pantos this year then? No, fortunately, I, don't, I haven't managed to pick one up uh, right. this year, which is quite sad, really, because I've done 18, you know, and I would have liked to have got one this year. But I think a lot of theatres are still it's, quite it's nervous. 
Yeah, it's, I mean, I've heard the ticket sales aren't as good and, and a lot of them have they've cut the runs down. Like the last one I did in 2019 in Darlington at the Hippodrome, beautiful theatre. We, uh, I was up there and uh, we started first week in December and finished sort of uh, 9th or 10th of December. But I think this year, the pantomime there is starting 12th or 15th of December and finishing on the 31st. It's not even going past... New Year's Eve, you know, right. so they've cut cut right back, um, and uh, yeah. So, but but uh, things are slowly coming back. I've been since the lockdown ended in the summer. I've been busy every weekend doing comedy clubs, and nice. uh, and uh, the, we did a few outdoor ones at first, and they were brilliant. The, the I people, saw you doing those with the cars yeah, in the car park. Yeah, well, the, these the one. Yeah, that was last year, but the, these were like outdoor. Shows where people sat sort of picnic style outside, um, and they were they were really good. But now, uh, at first, when we st- when the comedy clubs opened back up again, people were a bit nervous, you know, about going back in. But now I've noticed people are getting more and more confident, and they 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 really want it, you know. And so the last few weekends, it's just been rammed in the comedy clubs. Yeah. Um, and uh, that cruise, I've got my first cruise back a week on Sunday. I'm going out for two weeks on the, the beautiful Harmony of the Seas. Nice. Which is, a, as you know, is a beautiful big ship. So that's a massive ship. So you're going to be yeah. in the comedy uh, venue? Well, yeah, the, it's, a, it's a lot more work for me. Um, <laughs> but I don't mind that because I do sometimes get a bit bored when I'm, when I'm, on, when I'm on the ship. You know, um, Can't so. get bored on the Harmony. Yeah, I know. So I'm going to be in the comedy club two shows a night um, for six nights a week. I'm I'm doing two cruises back to back, so right out of Barcelona. So I'm looking because it's only a small club, obviously, and then they've got all the thousands of guests on board, so people book in, brilliant, you know, per night. So I'm and looking. That's out of Barcelona, right? Barcelona, yeah, yeah. So I'll get a bit of sunshine and uh, before the winter time comes, and then I've got another one in October. Uh, for P and O, and that's doing a stay staycation one round Britain. So I might be sailing past Cuddy. Hey! I'll give you a wave. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that would. That's be on the cool. Iona, the new Iona ship. Beautiful big ship. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, so and it's it's nice to see because, like I said before, I don't I don't do just cruises, but there's a lot of entertainers and crew and comedians that I know that all they did was cruising. So when that particular industry ended, it was like they had nothing at all, you know. Um, so it's nice to see them back sort of yeah. posting their little posts on Facebook and what have you going, oh, I'm back. Nice to be back working and stuff. Nice. I think okay, if any, are... I think if anything was prepared for it, it was the cruise industry, wasn't it? You know, with the, uh, they, you know, the sanitizers and all that. They took a massive. I'm sure they're still struggling now as well because oh, I mean, yeah. there's so many uh, uh, protocols that's in place that that. I mean, I understand why, um, but it, it's. I think there's more to come. I do believe there's more to come, and other things that's going to be happening. But uh, Stevie Royal, you and Stevie Royal, uh, who did really well in Britain's Got Talent, uh, you were doing yeah. a theatre show. Yeah, yeah, um, we're doing um, we're doing the Criterion Theatre in the West End of London in November. Very nice. Um, uh, yeah, we're doing two shows, we're doing a, a matinee and an evening show, open to the public, um, but um, we're inviting a few producers in and stuff, and the, the writer of the show is hoping to get a tour out of it next year. Um, we did, we did, a, we did a, a night in Lytham, where we did two, well, we did two shows, did an afternoon and an evening, that was an outdoor play in June. Beautiful sunny weather outside this big stately home. Now, and, uh, and we did the play and a lot, it shocked a lot of people actually because a lot of people that from that area know me as a comedian and they know Steve as a comedian and seen him on Britain's Got Talent but it's quite a ser- serious play. Yeah. And it, it is all about uh, it is all about the mind as well. It is all about the mental state because Dan Leno of I don't know if you know much about Dan Leno. I, I kind of researched him from that. He was a famous musical comedian. And um, 
it was one of the best comedians in the world, you know, in, in Britain uh, and, and probably the world, you know, he, um, he invented a lot of the pantomime characters like Mother Goose and stuff like this, you know, and uh, he, uh, the last few years of his life, he, he was, he, he spent in a mental asylum. Um, and uh, that's what this story is kind of based on. And a lot of people th thought he was going mad. And what, what it turned out to be was, um, medically, now when they look at it, they, they reckon he had a, a brain tumour pressing on part of his brain that was making him, he, do, he was doing all these involuntary like limb movements and, um, and doing all these mad voices and going into his act all the time. So while he was in the hospital, people thought he was going mad when he, basically it was this thing and they didn't know, obviously they didn't know about this. He's like 1903, 1904. You know, so he ended. He ended the the the, the last few weeks of his life in, in there. You know, with, with all these poor souls. So it's all about that. And um, that. So the story is there are funny bits in it. You know, when he's doing parts of his act because he was hilarious. You know, he, he did all these brilliant characters and stuff. Um. And but then it's also the side of it, um, which is the serious side. You know. Um. And it, there's there's I think. There's four of us in the play. I play Dr. Savage, who's his doctor. And I'm, we've kind of, it started off as a bit of a straight role. But when I got involved, the writer, we worked together with it. And uh, we've kind of made it into, a, he's a bit of a, a fan of Dan Lino. And he's a frustrated comedian, even though he's his doctor. And so he gets to sort of befriend Dan and uh, they end up kind of doing uh, a routine together where they both where Dan's thinking he's in a theater and they both do a kind of a double act thing and um, so there's that side of it and then there's also Dan's wife that's in it and and the the nurse who's played by Steve's wife uh, Janet who's nice yeah she's brilliant um, she started off as, a, as an actor years ago and that before they got married so she's loving being back doing that you know, so it's it's a nice little company, you know. And the uh, show is called Naturally Insane. Naturally Insane, yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we're going to be at the Criterion Theatre in the West End, darling. Very nice, very I nice. Can, so I can say I'm a West End star now, after knowing. I that. believe you have another family member who's a West End star? Yeah, we don't sister. talk about her much, though. She's too good. It's your sister, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Joe. Ah, oh, Joe. yeah, she's she's been in virtually everything you can be in, really. She's uh, been nominated for the Olivier Award three times. She's a uh, star of Matilda and uh, Cats, Phantom. Everyone's talking about Jamie. And, uh, yeah, so, so she's brilliant. Uh, proper actor. Proper act she's proper actor, whereas I'm sort of pretend wannabe. <laughs> and funny enough, my dad, uh, for the listeners who who don't know, he's, he's Roy Walker, he used to do catchphrase years ago. Um, he uh, He's just done, he got asked uh, to do um, Shakespeare in Love in the play. I mean, uh, someone did a play of it for four days in uh, in London, outdoor theatre. Wow. Uh, yeah, so he had a small part in that. Um, Brilliant. Yeah, so he loved that. Um, so yeah, we're all at it. My, my daughter, Verity, she's starting at uh, Arts Ed in London right. in September. So she's going to be the next generation. Brilliant. As I call her, my pension. <laughs> <laughs> when she's in the Marvel movies, all I want is a little cottage at the bottom of the garden. I won't bother her or, or any of her beautiful friends. I'll just uh, drive her to the studios and back in the Bentley. And, and uh, is, did I, is she's in a Marvel movie or is that... She no, no, when she is. Yeah, when she is. Brilliant. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Well, I've worked with your dad and I've worked with the, you. Uh, so yeah. love uh, to your dad as well because uh, I've not seen no, him for yeah. a while. Absolutely. I remember I did a video with him that's on YouTube. Um, I saw uh, it. it was, well, do you know what? I had so many lovely comments about once he shared his story and everyone really, really got to know more uh, about your dad. Um, uh, Roy Walker, see what you see, as everybody says. I'm sure everybody just says that, see what you see all the time yeah. with him now. Yeah. Um, it was it was a, phen a phenomenal story that he shared with everyone. 
Yeah, well, I mean, that was that was that was pretty cool that I ended up on one of the cruises we did together because I did a string of cruises with you, didn't I, yeah. before the pandemic? And then on one of them, he happened to be on board as well at the same time. Yeah, which was uh, which was unbelievable, really. Nice. Um, that's never happened before, or maybe n- never happen again, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, he's he's a good guy and still still active. Eighty one years old, still loves. Wow. Still loves doing the stand up, you know. Um, but obviously, all of his work kind of went as well with the cruises and stuff. And yeah. whether it'll come back for him or not, I don't know. You know, because um, the world's changed, hasn't it? <laughs> the world has changed, and we have to change with it. I we think have the to only change with it. In life, yeah. The only, I'm always a big believer in that. The only constant in life is change. Hmm. Totally. Yeah. And my wife is not good at that because she's got a new washing machine because I broke her original washing machine. She's still not going to let me that uh, live that one down. Uh, but she doesn't like the new washing machine because it's not the same as the old machine. And she's like, <laughs> this one washes for one minute, 12, one hour, 12 minutes. Whereas the previous uh, washing machine washed in one minute, one hour, four minutes. And she doesn't like the extra eight minute wait. Oh, dear. It's, it's, this is the hardships I live with. But she gets an she gets an extra eight minutes to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's really? got to be a bonus, hasn't it? Yeah. Well, Phil, I never got the chance to see you in uh, Panto, but I'll tell you what I do remember as a kid growing up, and I don't know if I mentioned this to you when we were on the ship. I always remember because you were the you when you're in the Pantos, you're the funny person, you're the funny guy. Yeah, buttons and simple yeah. Simon, that kind of character. Yeah. I and I remember Bobby Nutt in my Pantos growing from up. Yorkshire. Yes, because he was always in the Sheffield one. So whenever we yeah. went to school, I you used to always think, oh, I would love to be Bobby Nutt's role. I would love to be Bobby Nutt's role. Um, and so I always remember that role that you play. Built. So I'm sure you've made that connection with absolutely thousands of people. Uh, uh, through yeah, that. yeah, we we had such a good time um, doing them shot. I mean, I did, I did ten years on the trot at um, Blackburn at King George's Hall there. So um, it was just so good to be going back. And then four years at Preston. At Preston. Um, so it was nice to have a residency for a while. Yeah. Um, and then obviously the last one um, up in uh, Darlington. So the, the thing I like about the Pantos as well is, is working with all these different people, yeah. you know, from all walks of life. Like, on, for instance, in the last one, we had Shirley Ballas from Strictly Come Dancing. And then you'd also have George Sampson, who won Britain's Got Talent as like the little street dancer. Dancer, he, yeah. He's only dead young when he won it, but he still looks exactly the same. He's like... How old is he now? 28, I think. Um, <laughs> he's, in, he's actually in... Everyone's talking about Jamie. Oh, brilliant! But he's playing a uh, he's playing like this young schoolboy who's like sixteen because he he still looks like that young George. Brilliant, um, and, and still a brilliant dancer and stuff. So yeah, so that that's what I liked about the pantomimes is working with all these different people like um, from all all walks of life. I mean, I, I can see you as a good dame actually. <laughs> I, think a, I think you'd be a funny dame. Thank you very much. Well, that's I it. That's a putting a frock on. <laughs> well you've called me a seal so far and now a dame so I'll, i'm taking it i'm taking the compliments yeah a dame is one of the best parts i mean the, the last dame we had um um stuart he's called from scotland he's like a serious actor but every year he does the does the pantos and um and he's brilliant at it just mm. just loves it. It, it it is an art in itself the dame you know and People love the dame because you've got like that warmth, and but you've also got the funny side of it as well. You know? <laughs> Maybe that'll be next for me. Putting a frock on, getting a bit too old now to be buttons. <laughs> well, you might as well get paid for it instead of just doing it in the house when no one's around. Yeah, yeah, it's normally just weekends. So <laughs> went to the wife's shower, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Look, I know you've got a busy schedule. Uh, I know you uh, said you were just going to... Uh, I know you've got loads to do, actually. So I really, honestly, thank you so much for sharing your time. No problem. Not a problem at all. It's a pleasure you to so. see you. Yeah. Uh, it's been great talking to you again. Uh, I'm sure all our listeners are going to take some uh, massive value away from this. They get to see you if they want to join you in the theatre. Uh, the book, uh, The Snots, you've got two. What's the name of the second book? Is it The Journey to Space or something? It's, it's called The Snots and The Snot Rocket. Snot Rocket. Yes. 
Yeah. In Brilliant. fact, your backdrop, your backdrop uh, behind you is uh, is very similar to uh, what goes on in the story. So, right. A little clue for the listeners there. Yeah. Both available on Amazon. On anyone... Amazon. <laughs> Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> got to, you know, we've got to keep Jeff Bezos in uh, in uh, rocket fuel. You know, <laughs> not cheap, is it? Flying up into space for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Phil. Fly up to space for no reason in a giant dildo. What well, it did look like <laughs> that, but I no, it did look like it was a giant dildo that the, the rocket that it was going up in. But I was that the actual rocket, or was that just a Facebook thing? This is the rocket he's going up in. No, that was a rocket. That was, was it really? Rocket. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's hilarious. It didn't look. Like and he just went up to space and then just came straight back down again. Well, at least he can. He, at least now he knows that the world is round. But that's yeah. a whole different story that we don't <laughs> want to get involved in, Phil. <laughs> oh, the old flat earth. Uh, I love that conundrum. I love that conundrum. Thank you very much, Phil. Much appreciated. My pleasure. Lovely to see you, mate. You too. Uh, and I think I'm going to be seeing you on Tuesday for a wee dip at St. Anne's. Let's hope so. Absolutely. Big love from me to all our listeners. There's another episode of Chatter About the Chatter. Today's guest was Phil Walker, comedian, actor, kids writer, uh, and soon to be star of uh, The Stage in the West End. That's in Naturally Insane. You can check him out. Big love from Cuddy, as always. Tune into the next po uh, podcast. Uh, we've got some, some fascinating guests. Uh, and don't let the monkey mind take over your life. That's what we're here for. Have a great time. See you later. Bye-bye for now.